Okay. Well, you think after uh, five months of doing lectures and presentations, including keynote, I'd know how to hook up a, a laptop to an AV cable. Uh, so good morning, I think. Uh, great to, to be here. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Ben and Shane and Cascadia for, for letting us come talk. And, um, as Ben said, introduced, uh, my name's Matt Yoho. I was a co-instructor with Hungary Academy. We've got three of the, uh, the, the grads, former Hungries, uh, on the panel with us. Um, uh, I'm just going to talk for a few minutes, uh, briefly, like an overview of the structure of the program. Um, I'm not going to go, hopefully not, to go, not getting to go into too uh, much detail about it, because we want this to be um, a Q&A session. We want this to be a discussion. Uh, and hopefully you guys will have a lot of questions, so I need to make sure that you, you, you have them when we come to the end of this part. Um, each of the people here will talk a little bit about their experiences, and then we'll, then we'll move into the discussion part. So, uh, Hungry Academy. What, what was Hungry Academy and how did it begin? So, Hungry Academy was uh, an effort on the part of, of Living Social to um, uh, hire engineers, basically, to, to acquire talent but to do it in a way that um, was sort of non-traditional. Um, the problem, as, you know, as, as I understand it, was that it wasn't necessarily that they were having a hard time finding um, talented or skilled engineers, per se. It was that they were having a hard time finding the people with the right um, mix of uh, you know, technical ability, but also perspective, and in particular, uh, like an, an entrepreneurial bent, so that sort of you know, startup hungry mentality. Um, and decided sort of how do we, how can we tackle this? Well, one thing we can do if we can't find this number of people, if we can't find the people we're looking for, what if we grow them? What if we find interesting, engaging, passionate people um, from walks of life that may not include software and give them the, the essential tools they need to, um, to be a successful developer? Um, so Chad Fowler, um, who's now the, uh, the senior VP of, of engineering at Living Social, um, sort of originally er came up with the idea. Um, and as many of you probably know, Chad is a very uh, uh, prolific and effective teacher and instructor. You know, this is something he would have loved to have done himself, but of course his duties at uh, Living Social sort of precluded that possibility. Um, so he uh, partnered with and got in touch with um, Jeff Kasmer, who runs Jumpstart Lab as a sort of boots on the ground uh, training partner to, ki to, get the, um, to get the program running and to you know, do, do the day-to-day -day operations. So between the combination of them, uh, thus Hungry Academy as a program was born. Um, I was then brought on as a, as a secondary instructor, um, but I, you know, I have experience uh, working uh, over the last several years primarily for some uh, of the of Rails consultancies primarily that um, that are known to be you know effective developers of, of Rails web applications and in the startup space and whatnot, um, and also have a did my tenure my tour of duty uh, on on the startup scene uh, as well. Um, so this was effectively and it's probably a little difficult to see but this is effectively the the, the general weekly schedule. Um, that uh, the group uh, went through. Uh, this is kind of what we stuck to for the most part. Uh, at, at the outset, basically, we'd identified, Chad and, and, and Jeff had worked together in consulting with uh, the engineering teams inside Living Social as well, sort of came up with a high-level rubric of, you know, what, what is the essential information that these people need to be, uh, uh, you know, taught and exposed to and, and learn and, sort of, and, and you know, master to, to some degree. Um, to be effective members of the team. And starting from that, uh, we kind of mapped out uh, a curriculum. And you can see here if, uh, that the, the breakdown, I know it's right in front of me, so I'm not sure I'm turning around, but uh, you can see the, the breakdown of, of, the, uh, uh, of the week that was split between uh, instruction, lecture, like classroom instruction, and project work. Um, 
so Mondays, Monday morning and afternoon were, were like lecture and lesson time. That might include some workshopping, like you know, working on particular lessons, uh, code projects, going out into breakout sessions or things like that. It might be um, uh, you know, just straight like uh, slides and lecture of, of content. Um, then Tuesdays were uh, half days, so half, or sorry, split, uh, where the morning would be lesson and the afternoon would be uh, the start of project work. So um, there were always multiple things going on concurrently, um, as these guys will probably talk about. Um, on any given week, so you know, we'd be covering lecture material that would, uh, at the same time that they would have a project assigned, um, at the same time that there would be uh, a reading assignment, uh, at the same time they were uh, preparing for their Friday morning lightning talks, um, which as we learned yesterday, all of that lightning talk preparation really paid off. Um, uh, and then Wednesdays again would be split, again Thursdays would be project time. So. Um, projects uh, varied. I think we went through something like six projects throughout the course, six or seven depending on how you look at throughout the course of the program. Um, initial, there were some that were individual projects. Um, uh, early on there were pair-based projects and then quickly we got into uh, team-based projects where there would be groups of four. Uh, those projects varied from you know, a week and a half to three weeks. Uh, early on, it was focusing on Ruby, uh, and then quickly got into uh, Rails and, and web applications, um, things like uh, basic online store e-commerce sites, um, uh, applications that had uh, multi-tenancy support. Um, we uh, you know, caused them to create a, a service-oriented architecture approach. Um, uh, Various uh, integration with third-party services, things like that. Um, here's a nice, yes. nice example. Uh, <laughs> Trouder, for example, this was uh, a project that came probably like j just before the midpoint or right around the midpoint. Um, this, for example, was uh, illustrating a uh, uh, a real-time updating application. So this was uh, this. I can't remember if this was using Fay or Pusher, but uh, the group that. Um, created this uh, um, was using some sort of web socket based technology to to um, to uh, to implement the, the application okay. um, so, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of the, the demographics of the people that were in uh, the group um, we started out uh, and well and how they got there so uh, there were 24 students in the program and that came, I think, as uh, Nicole discussed a little bit yesterday, it came out of a pool of uh, around 700 or so uh, applicants, uh, over 100 of which, somewhere between 100 and 120, I believe, were brought in for on-site interviews, uh, going through uh, a round of interviews um, you know, at, uh, on the location um, with uh, living social engineers and, uh, uh, and other uh, persons from other parts of the company, uh, as well as uh, with uh, Jeff and myself. So that happened in three different sessions where uh, we brought people in and um, went through uh, logic exercises and, and things like that. Um, we, we got down to uh, 24 persons, out of which um, about eight people had varying degrees of prior experience in programming. Um, but pro of those, probably only um, you know, two or three uh, had significant development experience. Some people had um, experience in QA. Some people had uh, just graduated from school in a CS degree, uh, program. Some people, um, one person in particular, uh, had not yet graduated from school. Um, and then beyond that, then there were other persons from uh, other fields, like. Uh, Someone came in with uh, had been a uh, quantitative analyst with a, a financial firm. Uh, one person had uh, an architecture background. Um, we also brought in people from that already had worked for Living Social, so folks who had been in the uh, on the sales team or uh, in the uh, uh, customer support team. Um, we actually cannibalized the uh, head of QA for Living Social who joined the program. Um, so. 
Um, the, so I only uh, talk a little bit about outcomes. So of those 24, um, you know, all, all 24 persons were, uh, were hired. And there was sort of a, a mixed um, review to that. A lot of people didn't expect that. And, and I've been asked the question afterward, like, did, did you really think, how surprised were you that all 24 people were hired? Or did you really think that would happen? And there's sort of a tone of, you know, um, maybe, well, if you hired all 24, then maybe you did something wrong, right? Like, perhaps the program wasn't hard enough, um, which is a you know, reasonable thing, you know, temptation to think, but I, I think as hopefully as these folks will testify, it was pretty hard. Um, you know, I, I, I think that was a, um, a product of a, a rigorous selection process that was a product of good fortune. Um, you know, uh, someone, uh, I was in a conversation with someone who was saying, well, you know, really, the, this program, at, at, at the, uh, toward the beginning of the program, I was in a conversation, and they said, really, well, you know, this, really, people should wash out, right? Like, that, that's how you know you're doing it right. If, if it's so hard that people, like, just drop out. Um, and, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting viewpoint. I, 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 but kind of my response to that was, that, like, in the abstract, there, there's a certain appeal to that notion. But the reality is that um, these are 24 persons who have completely changed their lives. Most people, many, many of the people relocated to this city. They, they, they're real people, and we can't just treat this like a, a petri dish science experiment, right? Um, could be fun. It could be fun, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, the, but <laughs> in practice, we, we sort of did. I mean, the, the reality is that, like, um, regularly spending 14, 16 hour days, it, like, folks were sleeping in the space overnight. It was, it was like the, the most hardcore of, of startup cultures that I've, you know, seen, right? And um, people pushed to, to breaking points. That was sort of, uh, I think my idea was, we don't want to push people past their breaking point. We wanted to push people to what they thought their breaking point was, and then just a little bit further. And I think, <laughs> I think we came uh, dangerously close to, to stepping over that line of points, but it, in the end, it, it all worked out. Um, so I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite happy with that. Um, some lessons that we did learn, um, you know, we can talk more about that, uh, these later, but um, I think in, in practice, uh, we, we started early on with individual projects, and then we went to a, a pair project, and then we jumped immediately to teams of four, and we stuck with that until the next to last project where we went back to an individual project where we realized we needed to be able to get more insight into, on an individual level, how these people, you know, how the group is doing, how, how the individuals are doing, and because it came down to, okay, well, we need to start deciding, are these people going to be on teams, and if so, which ones? Um, and in retrospect, I think it would have been, uh, it's, it's clear that it would have been much more appropriate to, to alternate, um, to, to kind of, um, switch back and forth between group projects and individual projects to get more insight earlier and to, to provide more opportunity for, um, uh, for uh, like, uh, individualized, uh, you know, both intervention and recognition. Uh, also, we had two instructors, uh, Jeff and myself, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I genuinely believe we did, we did the best job we could. We, we, um, but we could have used, uh, we probably could have used another, another hand. We, we both wish there was more time for things like individual pair programming um, and assessments and just continual feedback. Those are, which are things that we did, but we would have loved to have done uh, much more of. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna stop talking at you and let, let uh, these folks talk themselves and sort of along these lines. Um, and then we'll, then we'll move on to the Q&A portion. All right. Um, my name is Mark Tabler. Uh, before I came to Hungry Academy, I was a technical trainer and a double extra junior Rails-ish developer. <laughs> um, I, I wrote code, but it was not awesome code. I, I guess you could kind of call me a paid hobbyist at that point. Uh, I came to Hungry Academy in the hopes of knocking the junior and all of the baggage off the front of that title. I wanted to become uh, the, the best developer that I knew how to become, and to, to kind of earn a spot uh, among the world-class developers that I knew that I wanted to be moving in their circles. 
And uh, in that respect, Hungry Academy really, I think, kind of delivered for me. I, I don't feel like I'm a, an experienced amateur at this point. I feel like I'm a new pro. It feels like uh, moving from the, the minor leagues to the majors. I still have a lot to learn, of course. I, I don't think that's ever going to change. But I feel like I'm in a place where I can do that now. And uh, it, it was funny seeing that schedule listed on the overhead because the, the schedule seemed to stop at like five in the afternoon, which <laughs> did not match my experience. <laughs> at, I also didn't see Saturday mm -hmm. or Sunday on that list, so it, very short schedule on that overhead. Um, uh, one, one of my most memorable experiences was when we were doing our first four-person Rails project. Uh, what we had done is earlier in pairs, we had written a store system where a, a merchant could list items for sale and a customer could come along and buy them and like the, the whole thing would go through order fulfillment and hit some sort of a credit card processing scheme, like the, the whole works. And our first four person project was to take an existing code base of that store, refactor it into a multi-tenancy system and set it up so that merchants are also a flavor of customer and customers can shop from multiple stores and, and everything like this. And that, again, that's project number one, four-person Rails team. So we sunk a lot of hours into that. And the, the night before it was due, or I guess I should say the morning before it was due, uh, we, we were st my team was still holed up in one section of the academy, like 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. We've blown past our code freeze by hours now. And I said, forget it, I, I need to go get a, like a soda or something, I'll be right back. Yeah, if there's anybody else around, I'll see if they have any ideas. And I come out of that room, and all six teams are represented somewhere in Hungry Academy. I don't want to say everybody was still there three o'clock that morning, but every team was still there, still working on this, because we had something to get turned in and delivered, and none of us were done yet. And I, I thought that was really kind of a, a testament to the spirit of what we were doing there. You know, we, none of us had any place better to be than Hungry Academy finishing this project three in the morning. And um, the, the last thing I want to touch on is, in terms of how I know that Hungry Academy worked for me is that it, it was a couple of months ago, I have completely lost track of time, so I can't get more specific than that. But I was, I was sitting down, you know, starting up a Rails application, okay, I have a user and I have this other object and the user has many objects. And it suddenly dawned on me what the has many method is actually doing under the hood because it's just a method. It's not magic, it's not weird, it's not anything unusual. It's just a method that's defining a couple of other methods under the hood. And uh, it, I, I couldn't have put it any better than this, so I'm going to borrow a phrase. It, it was when I realized that it's dogs at computers all the way down. That's, you know, oh, somebody else wrote this Rails thing, and they didn't do anything that doesn't exist in Ruby. It's something we can all do. And ju just that knowledge that runs that deep into, the, like, what's going on behind the scenes, that is one of the biggest differences between pre-Hungry Academy me and post-Hungry Academy me. And uh, next up for me, uh, I'm, I'm gonna try and remember what this whole free time thing is. I, I heard something about it, don't remember. Uh, life, that's kind of weird too, so I'm gonna figure that out again. And as soon as I've got that settled, then coffee script. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, hello, I'm Chris. Oh, I can hear myself. Um, I, before Hungry Academy, I was at school in uh, upstate New York. I was at Hamilton College, liberal arts school, pretty chill, lots of bros. Um, and I was a philosophy major at the time. And um, so I was really interested in technology, but I didn't know really anything about it. Um, I'd worked at a startup last summer, but I didn't have any coding knowledge, so I wasn't uh, coding, obviously. Um, so, I don't know. I saw this on Hacker News and thought it was something I was really interested in learning. Um, and so I dropped out and came here. And it was cool. 
Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Uh, memorable experiences. Actually, <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned the code freeze. Tabler and I are about as, as opposite on, on that end of the spectrum. Um, a memorable moment for me was, so we would present our projects after we were finished, and um, naturally I was pushing straight to master 15 minutes before our project was due, and um, I remember bringing down just our whole server, and being our first time we had built a server, it was just a nightmare in there. Um, and our whole team was just freaking out, very, probably a little bit distressed. Um, <laughs> So I just told them, I was like, oh yeah, like it works. And I showed them a copy of it on my local, on local host that was working. And they were like, okay, cool. And they chilled out. And then, uh, and then I just kept pushing to master until it worked. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that was, yeah, so uh, I think the, like, the best thing that I learned in this that I had no idea I was gonna learn was working with teams. And Chad would tell us this all the time, that like people are really hard. Like coding, like, I don't know, it's pretty, the problems are pretty easy and like the solutions we can do, uh, but it's like that dealing with teams, dealing with people stuff, and that's really hard. Um, so that was something that I didn't even have the expectation of learning, uh, but once I got there, it was like very natural. I'd taken a few computer science classes um, in just stupid things, like recursive linked list sorting. Um, and it, it was weird that it was always individual. Like you were always doing stuff by yourself. Like there was no source control, there was no testing. You were just kind of like derping around in C++ and like hoping something would happen. And it just seemed like this is just so obviously the wrong way to do things. Um, and it was really cool to get out of the program that like, I guess software engineers have this, uh, people think of us as like loners. Like we just sit in basements and like just kind of like hack away. And um, I don't have a basement, but I do do that anyway. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but it's like it's such a team activity. Like there is, there's just like such a community here is something I've learned in my first Ruby conference. But what Mark was saying, where like late at night, you had people who Mark's wife was still in Portland. Like my girlfriend was in New York. Elise hates DC. Um, <laughs> and Bookus did too. We had to take care of Bookus. We didn't even know. He wasn't even on Hungry Academy. But um, like coming together and like supporting that team and being their family and being there every hour of the day for them was something that was just, it was incredible. And uh, didn't even expect that to come out of it. So, that's me. Hey guys. <laughs> um, I'm Elise and I'm actually from Seattle. So it's really very nice to be back here. I did actually hate DC. That wasn't a lie. That's fair. <laughs> um, so my background uh, is in marketing um, and business development. So that kind of puts me on one way far end of the spectrum of non-technical. <laughs> Eli, please stop. <laughs> OK, I've got, I've got a front row heckler. Um, so uh, one end of the spectrum of a uh, non-technical um, background. Um, what really drew me to the Hungry Academy program is having been in the Rails community for the previous year and a half prior, um, prior to the program. Um, I've gotten to work with really cool companies like Peep Code and Jumpstart Lab, um, Code Climate as a consultant. And I realized what a fantastic community this was, and I just really wanted to be more involved than on the periphery. So um, when the Hungry Academy program came up, it was, it was a no-brainer to apply. The nice thing about it was I loved my job before. Um, I, I wasn't scared to stay in my career as a marketing person, um, but I thought it would just be another opportunity, another uh, path. And so when I found out I got in, um, it, it, was, it was difficult to leave uh, my previous life behind, but also just really exciting to be more active in a community that I really love. Um, so my hopes for the program, I, um, I was learning Rails for fun in my free time and I really, really sucked. 
Um, I think uh, the people at Seattle RB know my trials and tribulations through learning Rails um, with like very mixed results and um, it, it's really, really hard to be a novice surrounded by experts. Um, the, the learning curve is very, very steep. Um, and though I did make progress, we blew through what I had learned in a year uh, in like a day or two at Hungary Academy. So that pace was much quicker. Um, so I hope that I could just try um, and, and learn Rails. Um, so I think the most memorable experience for me was um, for our pair project, um, uh, another Hungry Academy person named Andy Glass and I had worked together on our, our first Rails project, which was a, a store, a basic store. And both of us were in the very, very novice section. Um, and it was a really difficult project, but we ended up in the like top three groups um, and dope. yeah it was it was really cool uh, to to prove that we could actually put out a functioning project without uh, any previous experience so other people who had been doing programming for four or five years um, our product stood up to that and uh, that that feels pretty cool um, so I also fall in a very different category than Mark and perhaps Chris in terms of how I approached my time in Hungary Academy. Um, I didn't like the hardcore startup 16 hour day. Um, I didn't think it was. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, and I, I didn't think I worked productively that way. I didn't think um, that anyone worked productively that way. Um, and I think um, there was a lot of pressure to stay those long hours. Um, and so I think this was actually a great lesson in learning how to moderate a um, group dynamic and be okay with, with not fitting into that group. Um, so that, that probably was one of the most challenging things for me is to say, sorry, like this is actually good enough. We don't need to do that. I'm going home. Um, and some of my teams appreciated that and some people did not appreciate that. Um, but that, that is simply how I worked. Um, it also, <laughs> uh, so Ryan's talk yesterday was really awesome. Um, I even had a dream about like writing a nasty letter to someone that was <laughs> mentioned. Um, but uh, I think it also uh, brings up that like everyone can be an asshole. Everyone can be um, a little crazy and um, you know, I, I think that I, I worked with a couple of people that I just didn't get along with and as Chris mentioned a lot of this was about working with teams and just figuring out um, how to deal with that. Um, so recognizing bad behavior and correcting it was a huge part. Um, so what now? They let me leave DC, thank goodness. My, um, and I'm moving to Portland uh, tomorrow. Um, and I'm really excited to be joining the merchant team, um, but being, being in the Northwest with all of these rubies that I love. So, thanks. Oh, really good. Great, so um, now we thought we'd take some time and answer some questions. Um, Ryan Davis has one, uh, Charlie, or where's the mic? Oh, Shane's got it, nice. So my question might be moot, so I just want to start with, does Living Social plan on repeating this experience? Um, so, yeah, so that's interesting. Um, so planning at Living Social is, is always an exciting thing. Um, so they had planned that it, another one would start in September, was like the original goal, like we'll just do them back to back. 
And like, that was ridiculous. There is no way to do that. Um, and part of the reason is like you make a huge investment in these people and like the people at the end of the day, the product of this was the people and to decide whether or not somebody is successful at the end, like you can check off all of the skills and there are all those things that we do, but they're, they're also, as Nicole mentioned yesterday in recruiting technical people, it's very hard because of that team aspect and like, do they fit? Will they produce value in the future? So the real test and Chad has said this to us is like, yes, you made it that far and like, this is awesome that we've graduated, but like the next six months determine whether or not this was even a good idea and whether or not um, it is something that is worthwhile to do again. I think a, a lot of people, everyone involved knows it was a success, but it's also hard to say like, we just paid these 24 people to do this and we like bought a floor of a building and like now we're gonna do it again. And they're like, well, was, did the first one work? Like, are they cool? And we're like, well, I don't know, but like we're gonna do it again. And uh, so yeah, I think like the testament of that is how well do we integrate with teams? How well do we produce? How well do we fit with the culture and like actually show that we were worth it? I think, yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, this just ended a week ago, which someone said that to me like, oh, how, you know, how are you doing? I was thinking it's been like two weeks, but as, as Mark mentioned, like our sense of time is completely shot. Um, but th there's, yeah, there's gonna be a process of like, wow, what worked and what didn't work? We, we, there are many things at the macro level we know didn't work or that did and we need to refine, but it's gonna take some time to actually decompress and oh. look at the outcome. Okay, so, so assuming you guys do this again, I, I thoroughly agree with Lisa's assessment that 16-hour days, uh, especially when you're, you're learning all this stuff, is complete bullshit. Um, there's a lot of diminishing gains, and you just start dropping off in your effectiveness and what you're retaining and, and everything else, and you're just grinding and, and becoming the asshole that you're trying not to be. Um, so what do you guys recommend to the program itself to try to address that so that you can maximize the amount of learning and maximize the amount of effectiveness without the grind and the death march. Can I, just before, like I would like to say that like, I threw out the, the 16 hour day thing at, is sort of to say, like these people have been working really hard. This has not been easy for, for anyone. And, um, that was a reality, and it, I would like to see that be different, and I want to hear, you know, as we all want to hear what you guys have to say about that, but it was, ne it was not necessarily like explicitly the mandate, right? It wasn't necessarily like that, um, there wasn't a requirement, right, that the 16 hour days are being put in. It is not sustainable, and I, 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 I agree, but you know, go, um, I, I think actually uh, midway through the program, uh, it was said like, please don't work as hard. Um, it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, did too. Um, uh, I think it w had a lot to do with um, like self selection for people that were very, very motivated, wanted to win, very competitive. Um, and that just kind of fostered a culture of very intense work. Um, I think definitely more could be done in a future class to say, sorry, hard stop at 6 p.m., go home, no more computer touching. If we see commits after, like, that's not okay, or something like that. But um, I, you know, I, I think it had a lot to do with the, the culture that just emerged. Um, rather than any explicit mandate. I, I think I can agree with that, too. I mean, I, I know that I put in, myself, a ridiculous number of hours in Hungry Academy, but much of that was my own choice. Um, as was alluded to earlier, I went to D.C. from Portland, and um, due to a number of reasons, my wife had to stay behind in Portland. And so I was kind of on my own in D.C., you know, renting the, the cheapest, funkiest basement apartment I could find. <laughs> and my, my philosophy was that for five months, I don't have anything on my plate except Hungry Academy. 
And so I, I personally felt like if I wasn't doing something productive, that that was a moment in time that I wasn't going to get back. I'm not ever going to have a second Hungry Academy for myself. And so I, I don't want to deliver the idea that I just worked until I was cross-eyed and spent you know, four hours beating my head against one line of code. But by the same token, I worked as absolutely as much as I was able to. And if I wasn't writing code, I was reading a book, I was getting ready for a lightning talk, I was reviewing uh, PCASTs or something. I was always doing something until I needed to rest, and then I did. And so my, my days were very long, mostly by choice and mostly out of kind of a nod to the nature of the program. If all I have is five months to learn what I'm going to learn out of Hungry Academy, what do I do with each of those days? I think we could have been uh, more focused with the, the, a message. There, there, there was sort of a message set at the outset of, of what Mark is kind of saying here. Like, yeah, you've got a finite amount of time here. Maximize that, right? Like, tr treat this, you know, Yes, the, the sort of pace that we're going to be moving at is not sustainable at, long, at the long scale. And five months is too, is, is too long for it. But like, there's sort of the idea that it is a finite amount of time, and you, 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 put, um, like you are free to put uh, whatever amount of your time into it that you want. But what, what became a problem and where we failed to, um, like, intercede or, or do the right thing or what have you was 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 stepping in where we, we if we when we realized that there were sort of like group dynamic and cultural forces at work that were sort of putting pressure on people to go beyond what they were comfortable with go beyond what was good for them like we needed to to, to figure out a way to step in and it was it, it was tricky because there were multiple sort of interests and messages and like cultural touchstones being Injected into the thing, I, it, it it was tough. I, I've been saying to to people, like for the, the last couple of weeks before the end, like you need to um, you need you, you should be aware that you're going to join these teams and you're going to feel like you're not doing enough work. You're going to feel like you're going to be fired because you're not putting in, you're not staying till 9 p.m. every night. That's not going to be the way it is. It's okay. Is that, are we not doing that? We no. don't do that. Okay. Yeah, it turns out, yeah, you can, you can go home for that. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to note that it was very, like, that drive was very self-selecting. It's hard. Like, you put 24 people who are going to drop their life to come do something like this, like, that's, yeah, that's really hard because we will drive each other off a cliff if, you know, if, if not watched carefully. And there were, yeah, there were definitely times where we worked and we were up and, like, the only thing we did was ending up, like we would just make our code worse. And so that was really hard, but that was also a very good, probably not on purpose, learning experience for stop doing this, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your team's time, and you're just like hurting everything because you wanna go off there and just like be a superhero at five in the morning. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, it's hard to control for that kind of stuff, but we also learned in a very real way why you don't do that. <laughs> At least I did. <laughs> More questions? Uh, Brian, right here. Oh, okay. Uh, on the website, uh, it says the the breakdown is uh, forty percent project work for and thirty percent classroom, and then thirty percent community. Can you elaborate more on the what was in the intent of the community? Thirty percent. What was included in that work? And um, if that 30% of community actually happened. Yeah. Um, I think those numbers were projections. Uh, and I'm not sure where that... I, I, all I know is that doesn't reflect reality. I'm not sure what the actual you know, percentages would have been. We didn't, we didn't ultimately kind of like uh, set out in that way. But uh, do you guys want to talk about some of the community? Sure. The, um one of the things that we tried really hard to do was spend uh, Fridays doing open source work and open source projects rather than whatever classroom tasks had been assigned. And I think that was more challenging than we anticipated because 
you know, on the one hand, if we can write a, a working store system or a working multi-tenant store system, then surely our code can be used in some open source project, right? But there's, <laughs> there's so much more to it that goes into contributing to open source. You know, there, there's community, there's understanding why something works the way it does. Uh, it, it turns out that not every pet feature belongs in every gem that you come across. It's um, surprising, I know. <laughs> but uh, so a lot of the, the community time that we spent trying to get that done wound up being learning how to operate in a community. And I, I don't think there was as much external uh, result from that as we were originally hoping. But the, the education was definitely there, I think. Yeah, that was, that was hard. Like, coming into it, you're like, oh, like, I want to contribute to open source. Like, I can write code. This is cool. But, like, that's just part of it. Like, finding meaningful areas where you can contribute. Um, yeah, we worked really hard on, we had a number of really cool projects. I mean, we had um, Dan, I think, got a commit merge into Ruby Core, which was pretty baller. That was early on, too. I don't yeah. know. He's too smart. Um, <laughs> And yeah, we had, I don't know, we had a lot of, towards the end it was a lot easier because in the beginning we were like fighting ourselves to learn, um, but we had a lot of people open source gems that they had used towards, that they had built towards the end for a lot of like API services that weren't well documented or weren't, weren't built before. Um, but again, like the program, what differentiated it against like just learning yourself was that you weren't just supposed to be a programmer at the end of it. You weren't just supposed to be able to write code. Like, you should also be comfortable with the open source community. No projects, no, like, people who are contributing to the future of the language and the community, um, which was a lot more important than I think people realize going in. And that is a very valuable part of being, like, a Ruby developer and not just a programmer. I think, sorry, go ahead, please. Oh, yeah. So. Um, I only got to publish one of them, but for me, my pet uh, desire for contributions to open source is helping beginners. Um, I think a lot of the beginner tutorials cover only the very basics, but don't clear that gap between uh, just you know having fun and becoming a developer. Um, so I published uh, a, a blog post on how to basically uh, use, uh, make API calls with like HTT party. Um, and just in a very, very simple format. Um, and, you know, best of intentions, wanted to do more. But once I started getting better, I realized, you know, oh gosh, I don't know this. I, I, won't, I won't publish this yet. Oh gosh, I don't know this. I won't publish this yet. Uh, and I think I, need to clear that confidence hurdle just to be like, eh, screw it. Like, the people that need to know this this much don't know that I don't know that part. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, also on the community stuff, I mean, so probably because everyone, like the students, were so busy working on their own projects, their own code, it was hard to contribute things like open source code. It was hard to contribute blog articles. But what Somehow, uh, they managed to, to contribute where, where things like time. So um, community was also like local community. Or um, uh, there were folks who volunteered on several instances for uh, Rails Hotline. Um, there's a program in uh, DC, a local program called Code Now, that is targeted at uh, exposing um, uh, sort of uh, kids from uh, underprivileged school districts, like exposing them to programming and going through like a multi-session uh, um, intro and teaching them like Ruby and, and things like that. And lots of students volunteered their Saturdays and Sundays somehow um, to do that. We just to had go so much free time. Yeah, with all that free time. <laughs> so we uh, to do multiple sessions of that. Um, you know, both Jeff and myself were uh, uh, volunteered for that as well and we're like running sessions. Um, the last project of the session that everyone did was um, uh, was creating projects for an organization called DonorsChoose.org, um, which is a very awesome organization. The CEO of that of that company, um, Charles Best, came and spoke to the to the group um, beforehand, and um, 
and everyone sort of contributed projects to kind of augment or help out um, with donors' shoes, um, which if you haven't heard of it, is a, uh, it's a platform for enabling um, teachers and classrooms to kind of propose, you know, to get projects funded. So I would like to take my students to the art museum and we need this much money to make it happen. I need basic supplies for um, this project in my classroom. Could you donate? Um, so it helped out with that. Um, and, and the other aspect in that early projection, going back to those numbers, the intention was to basically open source or make all of the learning materials and the lessons publicly available. And in effect, they are, but we, we changed modes so frequently throughout the program. Like, they're not really, like some of them are, are highly consumable and useful. Um, but it, would t it still will take a, a significant effort to go back through and sort of normalize everything and, and, really, and really publish it. But that was one of the early intentions that um, in practice, like we were all moving so fast and so busy that it didn't, we didn't follow through in the way we might have liked to have on that. But hopefully we will in the future. So next, I have a uh, request that we've gotten through two questions, so I would like answers to be shorter. Sure. We, okay. So Jesse has a question. Very good. Hi. So uh, down in Portland at uh, ELC, they're starting an internship program. It's going to be pretty small, four people, um, 12 weeks kind of thing. So from the participants, what would you pass on to people entering a program in terms of... Uh, just ad advice, like if you had one quick thing to pick, what would be your advice to them? Don't be scared. Uh, everything that's out there that got written, got written by a developer who started where you are. Uh, keep practicing the basics. What you think you know when you do it, you actually probably don't know. So every time you revisit it, you'll know it better. Um, so just keep iterating through even the simple things. Um, I would say ask questions, but like try it first. Like the thing that um, helping people, like the best people that you like really want to help are ones who have like tried it, tried it really quickly and like invested their own time in it and like clearly want to learn. If you show that you want to learn, I think like this community especially is like there to help you and is like so excited to help you learn. Um, yeah, and just like show that you have that initiative and go for it. Thanks. From a, a time and team perspective, uh, from a technical perspective, I guess, it sounds like it was a huge success, but the main challenge that I'm hearing is the time and team sort of soft skills. Um, I guess, Matt, particularly, would you consider adding more of the time and team stuff to the program next time around? Um, I don't, I don't think it was imbalanced at all. The, the technical was also very, very challenging. Uh, I, I think that the amount of work that went into the team building and the time management was more surprising. But I, I think that the, the balance was about right. So it's, it's not a question of more or less, but just being aware that that is part of being a well-rounded developer. Yeah, I, I think, in effect, it was a lot of people you know, realizing it through the course of the program that Software is relatively easy and people are relatively difficult. Um, we certainly put a lot of effort into it. In fact, we, we opened up, like in the first week, we brought in um, uh, Jesse uh, Sternstress, who's a lovely person whose name I always butcher, uh, uh, the improv effect. We brought her in to basically do a day and a half or so of workshopping with the whole group. It was like these um, you know, improv exercises around communication. And all of us did them. And I think that really broke down barriers quickly. And we, we sort of um, got off to a good start because of that. So we, we did put a lot of focus on, on teams. And we talked about it in lots of discussion. It's just, you know, if you work on a team, you probably know that that's, that can be really hard <laughs> frequently. So um, we would continue to emphasize it. But I, I don't know of any particular um, new tactics we would take off the top of my head. If you have a question. Just so I have an idea. I'm going to spread this out a little bit better. Okay, let's make them quick. So how did you uh, evaluate progress, um, and how competitive was uh, that? Was there feedback? How did that yeah, work? Yeah, uh, so we received points for things. Those were completely made up and were never actually counted. No one knows what the points meant. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's we did, at the end of every project, we did presentations, and we would kind of, people in the audience, both living social engineers, 
non-engineers and like each other, we would evaluate our projects and um, it was generally pretty clear, like you knew what you weren't great at and you would just work on it the next time. Uh, the uh, evaluation evolves throughout the program too and that's one thing we're going back again uh, for an another session, we'll definitely have that refined, we learned a lot on that. Um, we, over time, we moved toward, um, we did more code review. So one of the goals of the program was to, to produce people with developer skill and an entrepreneurial perspective, right? So, you know, ship viable products, um, that, right? So that was half of the emphasis. So it was on things like this, project review. Oh, is this a compelling product? How is the user experience? And the other half was code review and that, um, and grading or ranking or whatever was, was roughly 50-50 as far as points as, as Max refers to, but ultimately like the winners came down, like, you know, winners and whatever that, for whatever what that meant was, was really about selection of like, oh, is what you delivered compelling? But we also did actually look at the code and that was with myself and Jeff and, and then engineers from uh, Living Social Teams and gave, gave feedback. Um, I, would, I, I wish we had, been, had captured that feedback in a more concrete manner, so a more durable manner, but we did interactive code review sessions. Questions? Three hundred applicants, only four women. What gives? Uh, well, uh, it was actually closer to 700 applicants. Um, <laughs> as, as, <laughs> um, slightly com combative phrasing there, but uh, um, I, I, as, as Nicole mentioned yesterday, that kind of reflected the demographic of the pool of applicants, or the, the ratio of the pool of applicants as well. And that was a, a failure. Um, we learned a, a lot about how to disseminate the information, how to get this information to, hey, this is something you could and should apply to, to get that in, in other channels, um, to, to, so to get that in, in a, uh, for a more even and, and, and better represented you know, demographic, right? Um, yeah, I don't read Hacker News. The only reason I knew about it was from uh, Jeff Kazmir. So I think definitely a concerted effort in getting to where women are who might be interested in it would be very crucial. Yeah. I certainly would love to have you know, seen a, a larger ratio of women in the program. And what was the ratio of female applicants? I don't have access. I, I never saw that exact data, but it was my understanding is it was it roughly corresponded to the, the, the ratio in the final group. I'm getting the thumbs up from Nicole that yeah, that's accurate. So. The interview the interview rates were also ab about the same. Speaking yeah. of interview, we have a question about that. Um, what do you think set you apart during your interview process? Um, we had to make videos to like part of the interview process was initially, do you mean the interview at Living Social or beforehand? Uh, in general. Okay. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, so part of our interview was uh, completing a logic puzzle. And I came in uh, at, at the very beginning of the day. Um, I had taken a red eye to Washington, D.C. I was totally sleep deprived, like my hair was all crazy. And um, that was my first, first experience uh, through the different interview panels. Um, and I really bombed it. Like I, I messed, messed up uh, one uh, requirement completely. But uh, having talked to the person that interviewed me later, he said the way that I set up the project or set up the problem, talked through it with him, was actually what made me stand out. Not because that's you know just an error, um, clerical error, not a uh, fundamental error. So I think just slowly walking through the problem made me stand out. Uh, as as a person who administered many of uh, those, those logic problems. Um, I, I tried to present it as though this was something we were going to pair on, right? And that correctness or even completeness wasn't like the crucial criterion. It was how are we going to work on this together? Can you illustrate to me um, your thought process and how you're approaching the problem, how you might set it up um, in a way that I can follow? And let's assume like that I, you know, I need your help, right? And so it was about like 
the communication and collaboration process, how is the, you know, how is the give and take of information, how do you respond to suggestion? Um, and you were really helpless in that. I had him, he interviewed me. He was no help at all. <laughs> I had no clue how Terrible to solve the pair. problem, that's true. Uh, do we have any questions over here on this side? Um, I was just asking, uh, as anything you mentioned before, uh, like in, you know, sort of coming into a, a room full of experts as a, as a newbie, um, so how, how as a community can we do better uh, helping out with, with new developers? What can we do to sort of um, help bridge that gap? That's a good question. Oh, that's, yeah, that's really hard. Because um, I think uh, the Seattle RB crew was, extremely helpful when I needed help. Um, you what? You when yeah. I asked for help. Yeah, I would, I would usually beat my head against the wall for like, actually, Ryan trained me really well on this. It sounds really weird. But I would, um, when I first started, I would fumble around with a problem for a, many hours. Um, and then it got cut down to 30 minutes. If I couldn't figure out something in 30 minutes that I went and asked for help. Um, and I employed that technique in Hungary Academy and I think I was far more efficient um, in solving problems. Um, so yeah, I think just being available and not letting, not allowing people to struggle. I think the first six months that I was learning, uh, I was doing, you know, IRB Ruby stuff, but I could not figure out how to set up my development environment. Oh. It was absolutely impossible. Um, and so just that first step, once that hurdle had been cleared, and I think, you know, people helped me with that, but I'm not even sure I could do it now. Um, so, <laughs> like, just that first step, and then, you know, just continued checking in. Um, I work with RailsBridge here. I don't know if Renee is here, um, but we started Seattle RailsBridge, and I think um, that first touch is great, but uh, after the first weekend, a lot of people drop off um, and don't continue their learning, and I think mentorship and just checking in and being, being there supportive um, and crucial. that development environment, seriously, is a nightmare. <laughs> like, I just upgraded to Mountain Lion, and now, like, I'm getting these C compiler issues. I don't even know, like, I can't do lol commits. It's a nightmare. And so, yeah, so I was actually, a friend of mine asked me while I was in the program, like, I want to learn Ruby. Like, what can I do? And that step of getting, like, explaining what the terminal is, installing Homebrew, installing RVM, installing, like, that, to somebody who doesn't know what any of these things are, you're just throwing words at them, and they're just like, I don't know. Oh. Except so if you're on a Mac. <laughs> One of the things that I would really suggest that we keep in mind as a community uh, is the opposite of this problem. As, as a novice, I come into a room full of experts, and I think that everybody there knows something that I don't, and that's not always true. By the flip side of this coin, as experienced developers, you know something that new people would need to know. Don't be afraid to mentor. You can do a lot more help than I, I think is immediately obvious when you think about it. Did you guys feel like, um, as the teachers, um, you know, there's a couple different areas of teaching people how to code aside from the communication side. There's like the frameworks and the tools, there's the patterns and the practices, and then there's like writing readable code, writing maintainable code. Did you feel like five months was enough time to address, especially the readable, maintainable code? Because that's ultimately like the success of your scalability of your product. Like, do you feel sure. like you were able to address that in five months? I, I think that that was one of the big successes of the program and one of the wins from working in four-person groups because if I have written something in my project that my fellow coders can't understand, then I've done it wrong. It doesn't belong in the master branch and that feedback is very immediate. And b because it gets dropped right back onto my plate to fix and make readable, then yeah, it, it definitely became a, a noticeable issue when it wasn't there. 
I think we, we emphasized um, readable code and short methods and good naming um, from, from step one, basically. And um, honestly, I, I, I don't know if, um, you know how much credit we can really claim, but honestly, that, that was my biggest, uh, made me the most pleased or what I would probably regard as a, as a real uh, indicator of success was that, I mean, by the time we were halfway through the program to the end, like I'd be looking through and reviewing projects and the code was, you know, uniformly, like very readable. There, there, you know, there'd be exceptions here and there. We could talk about them and you could have discussions with the people in the group and they would understand like, yeah, yeah, I know that's bad. We, we, we're aware of it. We just, we had to get that done. Um, but yeah, it, it, the, the code, if you were to go back through and look at the repos and they're pretty much all, I mean, they're all public, you know, you could. The, the readability of the code was, was very, very high. And I think that was just a result of like continual emphasis from the beginning in different ways. You know, we talked a lot about um, sort of the, the fractal notion of, of development and code and patterns and um, uh, so, yeah. Got time for maybe two more. Andy here. I was curious about the criteria for success that you guys planned at the beginning of the program and then like how that ended up at the end and whether, I guess from living social side, whether it seems like it was a success based on those beginning criteria and whether those changed throughout the program. Um, so with the uh, criteria for success of the program at the macro scale or, or success like was any individual successful going through it? Sure. Yeah, um, I think I think well the, the criteria for success the macro scale of the program was just you know is the return on the investment of the, you know are a sig significant percentage of these people actually going to join the teams be like welcomed into the teams yes please we ne we need you and you're going to do great um, like that was you know that was it like in in, in absolute terms um, and then conversely that was the metric of success I think ultimately for the for individuals was. Are you going to be welcomed onto the team? Like, is, are, are you know, is someone going to want? Or <clears throat> are you going to be, you know, brought in? So, uh, yeah. Um. Um, I, I was wondering about um, if test-driven development. And your TDD and BDD, writing your tests first, and that sort of stuff, how that factored into the academy, or, or if it did? It, it did. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, we actually, so we wound up, we talked about tests continually, and I think we, honestly, we introduced it, that was one uh, point where we clearly made a mistake, was that we introduced rails and testing rails at roughly the same time, and it immediately became obvious, and should have probably, you know, could have been obvious beforehand, was, you can't TDD something you don't know how to do, right? Like that's sort of a fundamental thing. So if you're gonna to expect to, to test drive or really even significantly test a Rails app and you don't really know what the heck a Rails app is, that's not a recipe for success. But we, we did continually emphasize like yes, tests and when doing code reviews and the, you know, we had basically had rubric and criterion that included like are you writing tests? Are you writing tests at the right level? Like, does your test coverage and make sense? Do you have uh, integration as well as unit tests? Um, and we circled back to it once or twice later in the program after we, you know, they had more perspective under their belt about, okay, let's, like one day we, we went through, let's look at a full like outside in like BDD style approach um, and go, th went, you know, went through a cycle of that together. But I, I think also uh, the, so each project got incrementally more difficult and added on new things. Um, at the end, my last project was just a single page uh, JavaScript uh, application. And um, testing that, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so uh, I think, um, you know, we really, like Matt said, we pushed the boundary of, of what we knew how to do so significantly that it was hard. Um, what was nice is for my individual project, I went back and just did a, a, a 
service-oriented Rails app um, that was actually phenomenally easy to test because um, I was just testing that the API that I built. Um, so that was that was awesome um, to to know that I knew how to test track. Yeah, I think it it was very important. It was made clear that it was very important, especially. Um, Matt had stern words for me a number of times about like, and it, again, like that end goal played in, played in um, about working on a team. Like, does somebody want to work on a team with you? So like for my individual project, I hit a point where I was like three days out and I was like, well, I could do all these really cool features and Matt knows I love the new hotness, um, but like it made sense for me to just stop adding code and just test and just learn how to do that really well and like know that um, that's what th the things between like teams and an individual, like individual, I can push up to GitHub and I just push to master and it's all magical land and I don't have to write tests and whatever because I wrote all the code. But like working with a team, if you want your team to understand what is going on and like so that they don't bro break whatever I wrote and vice versa, I mean that was very clearly an objective of ours to, to write code that is maintainable because that, you know, at Living Social, we we have a lot of developers and you're gonna have to do that. You're gonna have to perform. If you don't, like, they will just reject your commits and that will be sad times, so. Uh, right there in the back. <laughs> Very excited. Um, I just wanna say, you guys are awesome. I'm very much a Ruby newbie and I definitely understand your perspective. Um, this is like my first ever Ruby conference and I wanted to ask, as kind of like, and coming from the outside of computer science without any formal training, I think one of the, the scary things with being in a room full of experts is that they know stuff about like theory. Um, do you guys feel like you're well equipped now after five months to not need to know theory and still be useful or how do you approach like getting into really complex computer science stuff? It, totally, it really depends on what you're doing. So um, one of our first, our first talk of somebody that came and did talk to us was Evan Phoenix. Um, who is just like, it was like week three, we were like, arrays, like what are those? And he comes in and he drops this talk about like threads in Rubinius. And we're just like, what are you talking about? And it was crazy. I still don't know what he was talking about. Um, <laughs> but uh, he looked great doing it, dreamy. Um, so yeah, so the theory parts, like if you were to be like, Chris, like go, write things in Postgres and like do all the, like that stuff I probably couldn't do like inside like the internal stuff or some of the compiler stuff uh, that was talked about earlier with Ruby motion that's up I mean there is a lot more theory involved um, web development especially like consumer facing stuff it's like does it work and that like our judgment it was it was interesting the way that projects were judged we would first judge them on all, all these like technical aspects and all that stuff and then it was basically like you can have something that is so beautiful and it is like NP complete. I'm just gonna throw out buzzwords, I, whatever. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, like you can have all these features, whatever, but like if it doesn't work, if the tests don't pass, if people can't understand what the hell you wrote, like the theory is somewhat meaningless, but there are parts, the parts where the theory really does matter, I mean that's not, that's not the stuff that we focus on, I guess. Um, I think we also took a very uh, product-focused approach, yeah. which was fantastic. Um, just thinking about what our users would find useful and going through making user stories, uh, going, going that direction. Um, I think learning is just a continual process and the more, the more we write, the more we'll understand uh, the patterns behind it. Yeah, I, I think the big thing I came away with is that when somebody throws a, a big technical complex concept at me, I'm no longer really afraid to say, I have no idea what you just said to me, but it sounds great. <laughs> Tell me more. And so that, you know, just knowing what I don't know and knowing that it's okay, you know, I, I happen to know how to write Rails applications. I don't happen to be great at big O notation, but I know enough to kind of smile and nod if you're going to bring it up. So. It's, it's just, like I said earlier, losing that fear and being unafraid to talk about what you don't know because everybody who does know these concepts started somewhere. Yeah, I think we also learned a lot of the theory stuff like 
in practice. So like we talked about Big O maybe the last week or the second to last week, and it was like like we, we looked at all the graphs and there's like exponential and like lines and like that was cool, but like by that point we had realized don't nest six loops. Like that's not gonna work. <laughs> like, don't join your entire database, every table together, and then like start doing things. Like that was stuff that in practice we had taken a look at performance and so theory like that. Um, so we have like a very um, like grassroots understanding of all this stuff. Um, Again, the buzzwords I'm not good at, but I, I'll look them up. All right, so uh, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, but thank you for your questions, and thanks to uh, Matt Yoho, Mark Tabler, Chris Maddox, and Elise Worthy.